A man is taken to the cardiac intensive care unit at a hospital in the Netherlands. About an hour earlier, he was found unconscious in a meadow. He's not breathing, he has no pulse, he's in a coma, and he's starting to turn blue. He is very close to dying. In order to intubate him, one of the nurses takes out his dentures, his teeth, and puts them in a drawer. They connect him to a ventilator, and after an hour and a half, of heart compressions, they've regained his pulse and his blood pressure, but he's still in a coma and unable to breathe on his own. After a week, he wakes up and is transferred from intensive care to the cardiac unit. The nurse who gives him medication there is the same one who removed his dentures. This is now a week ago, he was unconscious, but he recognizes her immediately and says, that nurse knows where my teeth are. He turns to her and says, you were there when I was brought into the hospital. You took my dentures out of my mouth and you put them onto this cart. It had all these bottles on top and there was this sliding drawer underneath, and there you put my teeth. He goes on to say that he saw from above that they were working to revive him. And he correctly and in detail describes the emergency room, the people who work to revive him, and the trolley with the drawer in which she put the teeth. The nurse can confirm that what he says agrees with the report. He knows what happened in the emergency room. This story is from a study on near-death experiences published in The Lancet, a renowned medical journal. But you can read about near-death experiences in Plato, or in the tabloids. They have been talked about at all times, all over the globe. People tell of life-changing, profound experiences that are fundamentally different from anything they have ever experienced. During cardiac arrests, surgery, car accidents, fires, they have suddenly found themselves floating above the situation. Anxiety and pain immediately evaporate and are replaced by a deep calm and contentment. They feel surrounded and filled by unconditional love and a deep sense of coming home. They tell of meetings with a deceased loved one who tells them that regardless of their mistakes and flaws, they are loved for who they are. Time and space do not exist. And they say the experience is so real that it appears deeper, richer, and more real than reality. In addition, there are plenty of documented cases like the one I just told. Patients recounting afterwards what happened around them during a period of time when they were clinically dead or in a coma. And their memory of the experience is sparkling clear. Five, 10, 20, 40, 50 years later. Despite the fact that none of the prerequisites for conscious experiences have been present in the brain, they say they have never thought so clearly, understood so much, or been so awake as when they were lying there unconscious with a brain without blood supply surrounded by screens showing flat lines and no activity. So a big fundamental question arises. What is the brain's role in this? If all of our experience is in the brain, then how can this be? So far, science has no idea. 
This fascinates me. Some experiencers have had zero access to oxygen. Others have had plenty of access to oxygen. Some have been heavily medicated. Others have not been medicated. Some have been deeply religious. Others have been atheists, at least before they had this experience. They have been young. They have been old. The research finds no common denominators except that people have been dead or very close to dying. I'm a musician and a composer, not a scientist. So I don't feel restricted or frustrated by the lack of a scientific explanation. Nor am I frightened by the spiritual aspects of these stories. Quite the opposite, to be honest. My life situation makes me think about death a lot. I live with a serious diagnosis. I have cancer. I have uh, tumors in my lungs that grow when I don't get treatment. It goes slowly. I can't feel them. But every three months, pictures are taken of my upper body. And in the last three years, I've had a total of 37 chemotherapy courses, the last one a week ago. It's a strange situation to constantly have to be treated for an illness that has not yet made me sick. Like many other cancer patients, it's the treatment that makes me feel sick. When I'm not in treatment, I think of myself as healthy. I have both cancer and good health. As long as I have no physical symptoms, it's the narrative and the words I use that define my reality, not the disease itself. And the stories of near-death experiences inspires and uplifts me, mainly because it opens up for a wider perspective on the nature of reality. Humans have always been fascinated by the nature of consciousness, of what it means to be alive, and indeed of death and the afterlife. Modern, secular society would increasingly have us throw away the beliefs and traditions of our ancestors. Yet, when we turn to the closest we can come to the experience of death, science leaves us without explanation. In my opinion, Knowledge, experiences, ideas from religions, indigenous peoples, art, literature, my own professional field, music, still have a legitimate place in an honest attempt to comprehend the nature of reality. I think we're missing something important when we dismiss and deride people who turn to faith and spirituality because the physical world seems too limited to envelop the full extent of the human experience. Because how our consciousness arises is an unsolved mystery. Scientists and philosophers agree that we are not even close to an explanation. For the last couple of hundred years, Western natural science has almost taken it for granted that the brain is behind it all. But this is by no means proven. Do near-death experiences indicate that there is something fundamentally wrong with the premise for this idea? There are many such unexplainable phenomena and experiences. Deathbed visions, out-of-body experiences, mystical experiences in deep meditation or through the use of psychedelics, terminal lucidity, and a wide range of so-called paranormal phenomena. Some well-documented and investigated, others that are powerful and unexplainable stories of individual experience, which are both meaningful and real for those who have experienced them. There are serious researchers at the University of Virginia, at Oslo University Hospital, who work according to traditional scientific methods to map and analyze cross-border phenomena. 
They are nowhere near an explanation of what is going on either, but they seem sure of one thing. There is something here. It is subtle, but they are convinced that these phenomena are real and that they can tell us something about the nature of reality. In my situation, finding, discovering that someone was working methodically and seriously to understand such cross-border phenomena as near-death experiences was like finding a mental emergency exit. Behind the door hid a lush garden where one interesting subject after another revealed themselves to me like beautiful trees I could climb to give my mind something good to do. I readily admit that I need something to believe in. However, I have never been able to relate to the idea that faith and spirituality spring from a desperate need to create meaning in a meaningless existence. Not before I got cancer, not now. My pull towards a worldview where death is not the end, but a transition to another state is like a warm longing for home that is just there, outside of time and space. It comes from a deep place within me that has no language. It is an intuitive quality that does not come from an intellectual place. Stories of near-death experiences appeal to both my intellect and my intuition. On days when thoughts of death become unpleasant and invasive, it is comforting to be able to fix my gaze on these stories. Because if what they tell us about death is true, then we have nothing to fear. Thank you. <laughs>